The results strong. Okay, guys, welcome. Praise the triune God. Praise the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father's beloved Son, His heart that became flesh. <clears throat> I'm able to do a session before Christmas. So thank the Triune God for His gracious provisions. Thank the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank the beloved Son of the, of the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father's heart. For his goodness, for his compassion, for his mercy, for his love, for his patience with us. Because we truly need our God. We truly need the Father. We truly need the Lord Jesus. We truly need the Holy Spirit. Father's Holy Spirit is the one God. <clears throat> the true God. Now, you see, you have this gentleman here. So, uh, David, are you mocking me by calling me by your mother's pet name, Shamu? Is that what you call your mother, Shamu? She's a killer whale. Is that what it is? Hmm. Anyway, so let's ask the Triune God, let's ask the Father, Son, Holy Spirit to bless this session, to save us from attacks of the enemy, to save us from <clears throat> stumbling blocks and obstacles of the enemy and from the children of the enemy to be covered by the blood of Jesus, to be washed in the blood of Jesus, to be purified in the holy blood of Jesus Christ, and to be filled with the Spirit. Father, we love you. We love your Son, the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit. Father, we ask that you forgive us for our shortcomings, our failures, our imperfections, <clears throat> succumbing to the flesh, to the desires of the flesh, sinning against you. Father, please, by the power of the Holy Spirit, save us from our flesh first and foremost. Save us from our imperfections, our own sinfulness, and save us from the influence of Satan, from this world, not to be polluted by this world, and the children of the devil, Father. Cover us by the blood of Jesus Christ. Cover our loved ones by the blood of Jesus Christ. Cover my daughters by the blood of Jesus Christ. Seal us by your spirit. Seal our loved ones, Father. In my case, my daughters. Please, for your glory, Father. We need you, Father. We need your Son, the Lord Jesus. We need your Holy Spirit. Grant us the holiness that we need to delight your heart from your spirit. Purify our motives, Father, not to do it for praise of men. Save me, Lord, not to be a crowd pleaser. Save me from being a hypocrite and save me from being unnecessarily offensive, Father. To do it for the glory of Jesus and give us the power of the Holy Spirit to be more like Jesus Christ in the way we live and the way we worship you and love you and adore you and the way we love one another and serve one another. To be doers of your word, Father. Please, Abba. And Father, anoint this session. Fill me with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from your spirit to go deep into the word. Save me from error and confusion and stammering. And bless your people here. Fill them with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from your spirit. Seal them by your spirit. Please, Father, to know your word, to live your word, to love your word, to proclaim your word, and even die for your word, the Holy Scriptures, your voice to us, Father. And enable me to recall scripture and interpret it correctly for your glory. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And please save us from our trials and provide our daily bread and provide for my daughters their daily bread. Please, Abba, to depend on you, not to depend on man for a provision. Please, in Jesus' name we pray. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. <clears throat> and we also ask the Holy Spirit just to fill my lungs, my chest, my throat with the breath of life and make the, the sound of my voice pleasing to your ears. Amen. Good to see you guys. Come on, I was getting close to 200. I'm starting to lose people, right? Keep praying for me. Um, people come ask, keep asking me about what happened, right, with that, that trial that was coming up. With When I say trial, I'm talking about not a trial trial. You know what I mean? With that situation, to be honest, I haven't heard any word about what happened. So I'm still left in the dark. So, guys, don't stop praying for me. Please covenant with me. Keep praying for me and my daughters. Fast for me and my daughters. Seek the face of God to do something miraculous, especially in the month of January, that God in his infinite love, grace, and compassion will just 
destroy all these shackles of the evil one of Satan so that I will not be chased down by a corrupt, evil, wicked system, a judicial system, a wicked, evil judge of the devil to be free to serve Jesus and to provide for my children. So pray for that miracle. Don't stop because the attacks of the enemy don't stop. So we can't stop praying and fasting. In fact, just to show you how vicious the enemy is and trying to destroy lives, I don't know if you're aware of it. If you haven't subscribed to David Wood's channel, Act 17 Apologetics, do subscribe. And you have if you haven't watched the latest video, I shared it on my Facebook accounts. David Wood's younger brother, Manny, is fighting for his life. He's on life support. His heart, his liver, and kidneys have shut down, right? His younger brother because of drug abuse. So he just did a video. His younger brother, Manny, life support, bar a miracle from God, and our God lives. The triune God is real. Jesus is alive. He can do a miracle if he wants to. This young man's probably not going to make it. He's on life support because of, you know, abuse of drugs. This man, David Wood, and his family have gone through a lot. His mother has been through hell and back. His mother has been through hell and back. So this gives you an idea. This gives you an idea that Satan does not sleep. His evil spirits do not sleep. And they're working around the clock to destroy as many lives as possible in order to break the heart of God, right? And Satan and his kingdom do not stop their onslaught against the servants of God, those whom the Lord Jesus has raised up and empowered to destroy the kingdom of darkness and all of these wicked satanic religions. Have you noticed all the attacks against all these men of God, even women of God, that God has raised up to destroy <clears throat> satanic religions like Islam? Have you paid attention to it? Have you noticed, guys? Go back and look at some of the videos that David Wood has posted about what's happening to his life. Cancer in his face. His mother having cancer in her lung, in lungs, had to have surgery. He has two sons attached to machines because of a rare muscular disorder. Right? Now his younger brother attached to a life support, right? Heart, kidneys, liver shutting down. His other brother's wife died of a brain aneurysm. And their son, he's trying to fight for the custody of his son. And then Nabil Qureshi, 34 years old, dies of a rare stomach cancer, right? 34 years old, leaves behind a two-year-old daughter, right? And, and, and on and on and on it goes, right? So this, again, just indicates how real the spirit realm is. How real the spirit realm is, how real Satan is, how real the kingdom of darkness is, and how real this war is. It's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. Now, what happens in the spiritual realm affects what happens in the physical realm, right? So when I say it's not physical, I'm not saying it doesn't affect the physical realm. Of course it does. The most real aspect of creation is a spirit realm because what happens in the heavenlies in the spirit realm affects the material physical realm, right? And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to loosen my tongue to speak clearly and without error for the glory of Jesus. So, folks, you need to covenant with us. You need to be praying intensely for all of us, not just me, but for all of us. We're on the front lines. Pray for our children. Pray for our families. Pray the blood of Jesus covers every one of us and shields us and the Spirit fills us because we cannot do this without the power of heaven, the power of the triune God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God's heavenly host. And remember, God has decreed, guys, remember this. God has decreed that through the prayers of the people of God, through the fasting of the people of God, through the sacrifice of the people of God, God will move and act on our behalf, right? So do not underestimate how important your prayers, your fasting, your sacrifice for the kingdom of God 
truly are in bringing about God's perfect will and the destruction of the kingdom of darkness. You know that, right? You guys understand that God has been pleased and has decreed that he will act and move in union with your prayers and fasting for him to do so. Did you know that? Don't underestimate how important your prayers are. Your fasting is to God to bring about his perfect will, will and hastening the return of Jesus and the destruction of the kingdom of darkness. Right? Do I need to give you verses to show that? Where God works and at times will only work through the prayers and fasting of his people. Let me remind you of a couple of passages. Job 42, 7 to 10. Al Sam, I love you too. I don't know what Al Sam means. It means the Sam. Job 42, 7 to 10. So I really need your prayers. David Wood, we all need your prayers. And my daughters need your prayers. And David Wood's family needs your prayers. And I need a miracle. Sai Christian can tell you what we're up against with this corrupt satanic judge, this whore of the devil. May Jesus save us from, from her. He can tell you. He's here. Okay. Let's read Job 42, 7 to 10. Guys, read with me. So you understand how powerful your prayers are and that God has decreed that through your prayers prompted by the Spirit, he will move and act. Okay, here, read with me. And it was so that after Yehovah, the Lord, Jehovah, had spoken these words unto Job, Jehovah, the Lord, Yehovah, said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for you have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. Now notice how God is going to forgive them. Notice how God is going to forgive them. Okay, let's read. <clears throat> Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that you have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. And Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Nemethite, went and did according as Jehovah, Yahovah, commanded them. And Jehovah, Yahovah, also accepted Job. And then verse 10, And Yahovah, Jehovah the Lord, turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also Jehovah gave Job twice as much as he had before. Did you catch it? Did you catch, catch it? God said to Eliphaz, Job will pray for you, and in union with your burnt offering, then I'll forgive you. But you have to offer a burnt offering for your sin, and Job has to pray. And when he prays, then I'll forgive you and not punish you. So God deliberately decreed the intercession of Job and the burnt offering to be offered up to be made on their behalf in order for God to forgive them. Back, pa Patrick Rooney, are you mocking? Are you attacking? Are you insulting me, Patrick? The reason why I say Jehovah is because I've been convinced because of the research of Nehemiah, Nehemiah Gordon. I pronounced it. Nehemiah, Nehemiah Gordon, that the correct pronunciation of the divine name is Yahovah because he has done research and he's discovered medieval manuscripts of rabbis admitting that they've known the correct pronunciation of the divine name all along, but they've kept it from the masses. And the way they pronounce the divine name is Yahovah, Yahovah, where we get Jehovah. So because of that research, I'm now persuaded that Jehovah is a correct <clears throat> anglicized way of saying the divine name. Correct anglicized, right? It's the Anglo-Saxon way of saying Yahovah, right? And don't take my word for it. Nehemiah Gordon, do a search on YouTube. He's got a lot of lectures where he shows you the evidence, the data. And he shows that the rabbis have always known how to pronounce the name. They've never forgotten how to pronounce the name. They just kept it from the masses. 
but they passed it on generation after generation among themselves. Yehovah, Yehovah, Jehovah. Uh oh, CP is live. My goodness, man, that sucks when more than one Christian's on at the same time. Al, Sam, let's focus on the topic. Forget about my weight. Forget about that you're a Mandian. Hopefully, God will grant you repentance from your religion and follow the true Christ. CP is Christian Prince. Yeah. No wonder I'm down at 78. See, everyone left me. You see? That's it. We're going to be down to five. Oh, well, that's fine. I'll never be popular in this lifetime. Okay, let's focus now. So did you see how God forgave Eliphaz and his three friends? And his forgiveness was conditional. It was conditioned upon the burnt offering and the prayers of Job. Right? The prayers of Job. Correct? Let me give you another example. Ahimelech, the king of Gerar, took Sarah as his wife and was about to sleep with her because Abraham withheld the fact that Sarah was also his wife. Abraham said, she's my sister, but he didn't tell him the full story. She was my wife. So before he could defile Sarah, God appeared to him in a dream and says, you're as good as a dead man. Now let's see what God says to Ahimelech when he says, well, I didn't, I've done this in the innocence of my heart. I didn't know Sarah was his wife. He didn't tell me that. Let's go to Genesis 20, verses 6 to 7. Genesis 20, verses 6 to 7. Al-Sam, I don't really care if you think you speak the same language that Jesus did because I'm a Syrian and I speak Syriac, and Syriac is from Aramaic. Al Sam, you're not going to last here long if you keep trying to proselytize and, and preach your religion, which is a false religion. It's of the devil. You need Jesus Christ, and you need to accept him as your God and repent of your wicked, satanic religion of Mandianism. I'm not here to tickle your ears. Your religion is no better than Islam. Genesis 20, verses 6 to 7. Let's read. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. So I stopped you from sinning against me. I stopped you from defiling Sarah because you didn't know any better. But now notice verse 7. Folks, God tells Ahimelech, Abraham has to pray for you for me not to punish you and strike you dead. Notice verse 7. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Did you catch what God said? Did you catch what God said? He said, restore the man, man's wife. He will pray for you. He's a prophet. When he prays, you will live. You said Mandian. Mandians are those who believe John the Baptist is their prophet that they follow. And then Mandians also do not recognize Jesus as God in the flesh, the Son of God, their Savior. In fact, I'm going to let you prove it, and I'm going to block you. Okay, here. Al Sam, is Jesus your God and Savior? Is he the eternal Son of God? Is he God in the flesh, John the Baptist God, and your God, and your only hope of salvation, Al Sam? Let's cut the chase and stop playing games because I want to expose you because you're trying to cover up and you're ashamed of what you really believe about Jesus. Mandianism is no better than Islam. Okay, watch. Watch, guys. Okay. I'm going to wait for him to answer because here again we have a nuisance so we can begin. So Al Sam. Jesus is God in the flesh, and you worship the triune God. Yeah. Morteza, you don't need to contact me. Keep your contact to yourself. Yep, see, Andrew Martin, you know what Mandianism is. You see? So this is why when he says he's Mandian, either he doesn't know what he believes. No, Marteza, you're not a prophetess to tell me it's from the Lord. Be careful to presume to speak in the name of the Lord. 
please be careful. Share it here. Share it in the text. Go ahead. Because there are many people who supposedly received a word from the Lord and told Nabil, Nabil Qureshi that God is going to heal you of your cancer. You're not going to die. Be careful to presume to speak in the name of the Lord because if your word doesn't come to pass, you're a false prophetess and you need to be stoned and put to death. But you're fortunate we don't live under the Old Testament theocracy. See? Did you catch it, folks? Did you catch it, catch it folks? So I know about two witnesses. Yes, two witnesses. So you know the two witnesses of Revelation 11? So Jesus revealed to you who the two witnesses are? Morteza, get to the point, please. We don't have time to waste because I want to get to the heart of the matter. We're going to talk about Christmas. No, no, no. Share it in the text. See, guys? Okay. You are the people of John the Baptist. Jesus is God too. So Jesus is God of John the Baptist, and you believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Then, man, you guys, Mandians, have evolved. Because historically, Mandianism rejected Jesus. Okay, guys, let me get rid of these new systems real quickly. Morteza, share it in the text. Okay, one more time, Morteza. Share the word in the text in front of witnesses. See? Folks, there were false prophets and prophetesses that told Nabil Qureshi, that God had given the word, he'll be healed of his cancer, and his ministry would be greater than before. See? Yeah, now send Morteza on her merry way. You see, a false prophetess who thinks she receives revelation from Jesus, that Jesus told her who the two witnesses are. You see? These are the people that disgrace Christianity because they presume to be receiving revelations, and they are false prophetesses. Shame on you, you wicked, wicked, wicked false Christians. Okay, let's focus now. Now you guys know God has decreed our prayers. God has been pleased to include our prayers to bring about his will. Did you guys see those two examples? Chaldean, Assyrian, this is how you're going to know something is of the devil. If God wanted us to know who the two witnesses were, he would tell us himself in his word. If God doesn't name who the two witnesses are, that means that's something for us not to know until they show up. And we're going to know they are the two witnesses by the things they do as recorded in Revelation 11. So, yeah. Thank you, Miss Piggy, for leaving us for CP. That's really encouraging. Right? Okay, anyway. Okay, let's let's focus. Okay, let's focus now. Now, with that said, let's focus. Let's get into the Christmas story because I want to continue where I left off. I promised that hopefully I would do a session. Hopefully I would do a session, Lord willing, before Christmas so we can unpack the Christmas story. And I wanted to talk about, I want to talk about <clears throat> the Magi because I didn't finish the point I was making in the previous session. I hope those of you who listened to the previous session learned a lot about the Magi and their importance and why they were mentioned. Why Matthew particularly <clears throat> mentioned Magi appearing to Jesus Christ, right? Those of you who listened to the previous session, you saw why, right? Because this connects them with the astrologers during the time of Daniel, right? During the time of Daniel. Right? If you guys had listened to the previous session, if you read the book of Daniel, you had magicians, astrologers, and Chaldeans. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, now focus with me, pay attention as the Holy Spirit guides the conversation for the glory of Christ. In the Greek translation, I'm going to ignore what Christ the way 24 just said because I don't know why he's asking me the question. I think he's probably itching for a block too. In the Greek translation of Daniel, the term astrologers is rendered as magoi, magois. That's the word we get magi. 
We are told in Daniel chapter 5 in particular, and all the details was given in the first session. So I'm just recapping so we can build on it by the grace of God to unpack the Christmas story. That Daniel was the ruler of the Magi and the ruler of the magicians, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans because the king of Babylon and everyone in the court realized that Daniel was truly a servant of the true God and the spirit of the true God was in him, which enabled him to know mysteries that none of them could know and interpret. With me there? So far, are you with me? Everyone got that point, right? Because I want to build on it. I don't want to confuse you. Okay, so now... This is why Matthew mentions magi in Matthew 2. The King James renders it as wise men. But if you look at the Greek word, it's magi. The reason why Matthew is mentioning magi is because he's connecting them with the magi of Daniel's time. This is why the magi knew that the king of Israel was worthy of worship. The proof that the magi... We're worshiping Jesus as God is in the name. They're called Magi for a reason because they would be the spiritual descendants, not physical descendants, the spiritual descendants of the Magi of Daniel's time. And because of Daniel's influence, these Magi would have learned about the true God, would have known of the true God, and would have known that the true God was going to send a king a king of Israel, who would be God in the flesh, whom all nations had to submit to and worship as the God-man. Worship as God who became flesh. And how do we know that the Magi of Daniel's day would have known all that? How do we know this? Because of Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Let's unpack it. So pray the Spirit will guide this conversation to go deep into the Scriptures, to unpack the depth of Scripture so you can stand in awe of who's being born on Christmas, the eternal God of heaven and earth who becomes flesh and is born as a babe from the Blessed Virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Let's read. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So notice there's two divine figures. Guys, pay attention. So you don't get lost and ask me to repeat a point if it's not as clear. Notice son of man approaches the ancient of days. That's two. Son of man coming to the ancient of days. One like the son of man. In other words, he had the appearance of a human being. He looked human because he is human, but he's more than human. <clears throat> now follow with me. And this goes back to your question, David, about the two powers in heaven. Here you have a passage that speaks of the two powers in heaven. The Son of Man, a divine being with human semblance. He's a divine person who appears human approaching another divine being or a divine person. Because we don't believe the being of God is more than one. There's only one eternal infinite being we call God. But there's more than one person who possesses and shares in that being. You with me there? So. Son of man approaches the Ancient of Days. That's two distinct divine persons. With me? How do we know that Son of Man is the divine person? Well, let's read again. Daniel 7, 13 to 14. Daniel 7, 13 to 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now watch here. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So he is an eternal king with an eternal kingdom that's indestructible. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people... Nations and languages should serve him. So that includes the Persians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians. All nations of the entire earth must 
serve this king and submit themselves to this king because he is their king forever and ever. So far, are you with me? Jonathan, you just read the text, brother. Sometimes your questions hurt me because the text is in front of your eyes. He's coming to the Ancient of Days on the clouds. Why are you talking about him coming to the earth of the clouds? Which part of verse 13 wasn't clear, Jonathan? Why do you guys ask me questions that the answer is in the text? You guys are much smarter than that. So why would you ask me that question, Jonathan Simon? Which part of 13 wasn't clear when it says, He came with the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days? I get baffled, honestly. I'm being honest. I get baffled by some of the questions I get asked because the text is right in front of your eyes. It's black and white. It's not coded. Send Patrick this barking dog on his merry, merry way. Send him out of here. This is another dog of the devil sent to distract. Yeah. So, Jonathan, answer the question for me. The Son of Man rides the clouds to appear before who? The inhabitants of the earth? Post Daniel 7.13 one more time. Sorry, folks, for the delay. One more time. Let's read it. I don't care how people interpret it, Jonathan. I'm asking you, what does the text say? Don't tell me how people interpret it. Tell me what the text says. What does the text say? Folks, when it says he rides the clouds of heaven, he rides the clouds of heaven to appear before who? The inhabitants of the earth? What does the text say? Everyone read it. I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the earth or the ancient of days. Okay, so why would someone ask me, is this Jesus appearing on earth with the clouds of heaven? The text is right there in front of our eyes. Folks, don't make a passage much more complicated than it needs to be. The Bible, for the most part, is simple. There are passages that are difficult, but for the most part, you can see a passage and you can decipher its meaning just by reading carefully, attentively. Right? Why would I need to answer a question that's answered by the text if you let the text speak? The problem is, is you're coming with traditions and reading those traditions into the text so the traditions are blinding you from what the passage clearly says. You don't need to know the Aramaic. You don't need to be a scholar to see the plain reading of the text. He's approaching the Ancient of Days. Right? Before I move on, that's why my sessions sometimes take longer than they should, because I have to do a lot of explaining, unpacking, due to people being affected and influenced by traditions that are not anchored in the interpretation of Scripture, right? Not all traditions are bad, but tradition can hinder you from seeing the clarity of the passage. Why would someone's interpretation that says Daniel 7 is referring to Jesus coming to the earth in the clouds of heaven hinder me from seeing that the text plainly says that this is referring to Jesus coming to the Father in heaven? Right? I don't even think it's inductive reasoning because inductive reasoning is letting the text inform your understanding of the passage. There's nothing inductive about it. It's actually deductive. You're using the wrong term. Deductive is I've assumed something and then I go and read that into the text. Right? You get my point? Built for speed? 
deductive is I assume something and then try to find justification for my assumption, my belief in the text. Inductive is, okay, I'm just going to read the Bible and try to see what the Bible says in its own context and then derive my beliefs from reading it correctly. Right? You get my point? Now, no one comes to the Bible completely neutral. That's impossible. We're all conditioned, impacted, affected by our upbringing, by our culture, by our traditions, by our fallen nature, by the influence of sin, Satan, and the world. No one comes to the Bible completely neutral. So that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And the Holy Spirit, by his sovereign power, transforms us, renews us, rejuvenates us, so that now we think God's thoughts after God and see the Bible the way God wants us to see it. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in us, and that's part of our sanctification. You get my point? Part of our sanctification is the Holy Spirit to mature our thinking and purify our thoughts, renew our mind to see the word the way the Holy Spirit intends the word to be interpreted, seen, and believed, and lived out. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And that's a process over time, right, until we attain glorification, where we're now completely perfect in the way we think, the way we see, the way we perceive, the way we understand, the way we speak, the way we live. Right? Now, let me look at Daniel 7.13. I guess it's going to take much longer than I anticipated. I hope this is not boring you guys, not torturing you guys, not putting you guys to sleep. Sometimes I get tired. I get frustrated. I feel sad for you guys. Let me tell you some one of my frustrations. I get tired and I get frustrated and I get disheartened for you guys because it feels like sometimes I'm just going on a rant. And I'm just repeating the same point over and over again and tiring you out. And that tires me out when I tire you out because I don't want that. I don't want to tire you out. I don't want to beat you down because, you know, I just don't want to do it. I want to be used of the Holy Spirit to bless you, right, to encourage you, to build you up. By the power of the Holy Spirit using me. But sometimes I feel like when I have to step back and then correct someone and then go on this tirade, I feel like I'm torturing guys and I get discouraged because that's not what I want to do as a teacher, honestly. I really don't want to do that. And I don't want to make my sessions longer than they need to be. But you know what? I'm trusting the Holy Spirit. And I pray I yield more to the Spirit and that all of us are filled with the Spirit more and more so that we are less of ourselves. And more like Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, let's look at Daniel 7.13. What getting hunger? For a 47-year-old man, the word of truth, the word the truth, I feel much older than my age. I feel much older than my age. Honestly. Even though I'm 47, I really feel like, man, I'm in my 70s. I feel beaten down. Honestly. I'm just letting you know. I feel like I've been in so many wars that I'm so just like battle scarred. You know, I'm tired. Now, when I say I'm tired, don't don't get me wrong. You guys who are born of the Spirit can understand what I'm about to tell you. If you're born of the Spirit, you can be sad and even depressed and lonely and down. But right there inside you there is a peace a joy and a love that fills you that you know is not from you it is from the holy spirit and that's what i go through every day you get what i'm saying there's not a day i don't wake up feeling down and lonely and sad because of my my daughters i'm in love with my daughters i ache for them and so <clears throat> There's not a day I don't just sit there lonely and sad. But at the same time, same time, there's this joy and a calmness and a peace and a love filling me alongside my sadness and loneliness. Because that's God. 
That's the Father. That's the Son. That's the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, Daniel 7, 13. Now, now Jonathan, Simon, Daniel 7, 13. Let me tie it in with the New Testament. Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now, Jonathan, Simon, this says... The Son of Man rode the clouds of heaven to appear before the Ancient of Days. From the New Testament perspective, this would mean that this is Jesus returning to heaven to approach the Father in heaven, to be crowned by the Father, enthroned by the Father, after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, right? If I were to interpret Daniel 7.13 in light of the New Testament, this means that what Daniel is seeing is the post-resurrected Jesus. Jesus, after rising from the dead, being made physically indestructible, immortal, riding the clouds of heaven, right, to enter into heaven, to appear to the Father in heaven, to receive the kingdom from the Father as he goes back to heaven, a kingdom that was his that he set aside, right? Everyone with me? You understand what Daniel's seeing from the perspective of the New Testament? Well, that's what it is, Black Smurf. If you're going to now let the New Testament interpret this, right? Then this is referring to Jesus in his post-resurrected ascension into heaven, where he returns to heaven on the clouds of heaven, returns to the Father in heaven to receive his kingdom. Right now, let me prove to you that's what Daniel's seeing in light of the New Testament revelation from the New Testament perspective. That's how the New Testament interprets Daniel 7. You guys ready for the proof? You guys ready for the proof? Let me repeat what I'm going to show you that what Daniel is seeing is Jesus returning to heaven to the Father's heavenly presence on the clouds of heaven to receive his kingdom and sit in throne with the Father. That's what Daniel is seeing in light of the New Testament interpretation. Here's the proof. Acts 1, Acts 1, 9 to 11. Here's the proof. Acts 1, 9 to 11. One means yes, two means no, meaning yes, we get it, no, we don't get it, yes, no. That's what it is. That's a, It's our secret code system. Acts 1, 9 to 11, read with me, folks. And when he had spoken these things, this speaking Jesus, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Hmm. Jesus physically ascends into a cloud, disappears, disappears. Where? Where did he go from there in that cloud? And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye've seen him go into heaven. Hmm. Folks. Jesus physically descend, ascends, I'm sorry, physically ascends into a cloud and disappears. So he took off physically in a cloud. Where do you think he went from there in the cloud? Where did he go? Where did he go? Come on, guys, help me out. Now, when you say heaven, he already ascended into heaven. Remember, heaven can be the atmosphere, the sky. Heaven can mean space, or heaven can mean God's abode, where the angels dwell. First, it says he physically ascended into a cloud in heaven. Well, what heaven is this talking about? Space, not space, the sky, the atmosphere. So there it's saying... 
He physically ascended into the sky, entered into a cloud that was in the sky, and then disappeared. Right? So when he ascended into the sky, to enter into the cloud that was in the sky, he took off. Where did he take off to? He took off into another dimension, a spiritual dimension, which we call heaven as well. That dimension, which we call heaven, is where God the Father appears visibly on the throne and where the angels dwell before his presence. You with me so far? Everyone with me so far? Acts 2, 32 to 33. Acts 2, 32 to 33. I hope it's making sense. Sometimes I feel like I'm torturing you guys. Acts 2, 32, 33. This Jesus have God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. Now notice 33. Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted. So now let's tie in the passages together. God raised up Jesus physically, he's physically alive, and then was exalted to the right hand of God. So that means when they saw Jesus physically ascend into a cloud that was in the sky and then disappeared, that means he went in that cloud that was in the sky and then from there ascended into this spiritual dimension called heaven to sit at the Father's right hand. That's what Daniel saw. Now tie it in with Daniel. When Daniel saw the Son of Man riding the clouds of heaven to appear before the Ancient of Days, he was seeing the physically resurrected Jesus <clears throat> riding the clouds to enter into God's heavenly presence, to receive the throne from God, to sit as co-ruler with God. That's what he saw. And that's what the New Testament just confirmed. That's what Acts just confirmed. Is it a coincidence that the disciples see Jesus physically enter a cloud that was in the sky called heaven? So understand what you're reading now. If you just understood what I just said, if you're connecting it, that means the disciples only saw Jesus physically enter a cloud in the sky. But then Daniel saw Jesus enter that dimension called heaven on the clouds. Daniel saw what they did not see. Daniel saw what they did not see. By the Holy Spirit, Daniel was allowed to see the physically resurrected Christ riding the clouds into heaven's throne. To sit and throw next to the Father. The disciples did not see that. Why would it matter, Jeremiah? Jeremy. You understand? The disciples did not see Jesus enter. This spiritual dimension called heaven, where God sits enthroned visibly, meaning the Father, appears visibly on the throne before the inhabitants of heaven. Daniel saw it. They didn't. And Daniel saw it by revelation of the Holy Spirit. He was given a glimpse of a future reality that hadn't transpired yet. I'm letting it sink in before I move on to the next point. I'm letting it sink in before I move on to the next point. Okay? So thanks to Jonathan Simon's question, which allowed me to fully elaborate on the implication of Daniel 7.13 and how the New Testament interprets that passage and how the New Testament records the fulfillment of it. Right? Before I move on, who didn't get it? 
So now, Daniel 7.13 is not Jesus coming to the earth on the clouds of heaven. He will come on the clouds of heaven to the earth. Daniel seeing Jesus returning to heaven, to the Father in heaven on the clouds of heaven. That's what Daniel saw. That he'll return on the clouds of heaven to the earth? Yes, he will. But that's not what Daniel saw. And how do I know Jesus will return to the earth and the clouds of heaven? He went back to heaven to sit in throne with the Father in heaven on the clouds of heaven. And then he'll come back out of heaven on the clouds of heaven to the earth. How do I know? How do I know that's going to happen? No, Isaiah 19 has nothing to do with Jesus' return, Protestant. Don't quote that in reference to the second coming. Yep, JC and Anna got it. Because the angel said the same way he left the earth, he's going to return to the earth. Remember Acts 1, 9, 11? They tell the disciples the same way he left is the way he's going to return. So if he physically left the earth in a cloud, he's going to physically return to the earth in a cloud. So a cloud is going to show up, and he's going to descend physically out of the cloud like he physically ascended into the cloud. Acts 1, 9 to 11. Exactly. Exactly. Everyone got it so far? Before I move on? Yeah, I think I'm going to have to do more than one session. Okay. The Lord helps me. Helps me, my God, for your glory in Jesus' name. Okay. So, yes, Black Smurf, it will be the same spot. And let me tell you what spot it was. Acts 1, 9 to 12. Acts 1, 9 to 12. Let's see what spot will Jesus return to, where did he leave from, and where he, will he return to. Pay attention, Black Smurf. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, beheld, while they beheld, while they looked physically with their eyes, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And when they looked steadfastly toward heaven, here heaven means the sky. When they looked steadfastly in the sky, right? As he went up, as he was physically going up, Behold, two men stood by them white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall go back, shall co so come, Lord, loosen my tongue for your glory in Jesus' name, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Okay. Protestant dropping the ball. I don't know why he fell asleep. I said Acts 1, 9 to 12. I guess in his Bible, there's no verse 12. You scared of verse 12, Protestant? What happened? You got raptured? <laughs> then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. So Black Smurf, even though Protestant went to sleep, you know, again, we got to forgive him because I don't pay him nothing for nothing, you know. So that check that I'm going to send him, that will be blank with zero, zero, zero on it because I don't pay him nothing for nothing. Anyway, Jesus left from where, Black Smurf? Once you read Acts 1.12, and not snooze or you lose, Protestant. That's why you got to become Orthodox or Catholic. You Protestants are always like protesting. Don't want to do what you're told. Black Smurf, Jesus will return to what location in light of Acts 112? You see it? They return from the mount called Olivet. So Jesus left from where, Black Smurf? So I'll make sure the brother's getting it. So Jesus will return to what place? If he left from Mount Olive and he's going to return the same way he left, he's going to return to where? What location? Black Smurf? Let's try this again, Black Smurf, one more time. You're not getting it. 
Jerusalem is a big place. If you're not getting it, as it is, guy, notice this guy, Galilee. Acts 1, 9 to 12, the angels say the way Jesus left is the way he's, he'll return. He's going to come back the way he left. So physically, he leaves a certain location and a cloud disappears. That means he's going to appear in a cloud and descend physically to that location. What location did he leave from? Acts 1, 9 to 12. Acts 1, 9 to 12. Acts 1, 9 to 12, what location did he leave from? Come on, guys. We don't want to make this longer than it has to be. What location did he leave from? Black Smurf, help me out here. Earth calling Black Smurf. Come in, Black Smurf. What happened? Black Smurf checked out. I'm doing this for him and he's not responding. It's okay. I'm asking him again. Okay. So you sure you got it, Black Smurf? If he left from Mount Olivet, where is he going to return to? Why would you say Jerusalem the first time? Jerusalem is a big place. Where will Jesus return to? Call me for what? Where will Jesus return to? If the angel said he's going to come back the way he left, he left from the Mount of Olives, where is he going to return to? Just want to make sure you're getting it. You see, um, if you guys are wondering why I'm dragging, because if you don't get it, then you won't be able to then understand what the passages are saying, then you can't use it in your evangelism. Okay. So, Black Smurf, you are crystal clear. That Jesus is going to return to the Mount of Olives, right? You have no doubt that's what the text says. So if he physically left the Mount of Olives in a cloud, that means when he comes back, because the angel says he's going to come back the way he left, he's going to appear in a cloud and physically descend from the cloud to the Mount of Olives, right? Right, Black Smurf? Now, if you've been following me in the previous sessions, then you should be able to use this to prove that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. If you've been following me and listening to my other sessions, and I know many of you already know this, but even though people may have learned heard it in the past, they forget, which is why I sound like a broken record and torture people by repeating the same point over and over again. If Jesus physically leaves a of olives in a cloud, and the angel said the way he left, he's going to come back. That means he's going to then appear in a cloud one day known to him, and then physically descend out of the cloud to the Mount of Olives. Because he left from the Mount of Olives, he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives. There's no way around this. No way around this. But then let's go to Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Yeah, this is going to take another session. <laughs> Why can't I make sessions short? Why can't my sessions be 20 minutes and 30 minutes? <laughs> All right. Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Okay. Read with me. No, it's not your fault, Black Smurf. Don't feel bad. And I'll explain to you why you shouldn't feel bad, honestly. Just But read with me, Black Smurf. Read Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Behold, the day of Jehovah cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rife, rife, rifled, or rifed, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Pay attention now, Black Smurf. Then shall Jehovah go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. <clears throat> 
Yeah, because uh, Pal Talk acts up. I'm not Pal Talk. YouTube acts up. Protestant will post the verse, but it gives the second half of the verse before it gives the first half. So notice Zechariah 14, 14 is in the wrong order. So do me a favor, repost verses 4 and 5. Zechariah 14, verse 4 is in the wrong order. Right? So post verses 4 and 5. That I don't know why YouTube does it for him. It's either his computer and I got to blame him even more and rebuke him even more, even though he's doing this as a token of love. He doesn't get paid for it. If he did, then he'd give me an excuse to come look for him and smash his head with a rod and then repent later. <laughs> Zechariah 14, verses 4 and 5. Oh, la, 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 la. Ha, oh. Tell me I'm not bipolar. Zechariah 14, verses 4 and 5. And his feet shall stand in that day. Sorry, we're going to have to do it over again. Let's do Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 5, because I don't think you guys are going to get the connection. Let's do for Zechariah 14, 3, 4, and 5. For, for some reason, sometimes when he posts a verse, YouTube will post the second part of the verse before the first part, the first half. I don't know why it does that. I guess YouTube has a mind of its own. Zechariah 14, 3 to 5. So this poor brother gets tortured by trying to keep up with me. So God bless him and his family. Read with me now, Black Smirk, because I want you to catch this. Then shall the Lord Jehovah go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So Jehovah's the one coming. That's why I said we got to read three. Jehovah will go forth and fight. Not a angelic creature. Jehovah. Jehovah. I want to hear. I'm going to repeat it again. You can't get around this, anti-Trinitarian. You can't get around this, Jehovah Witness. It says Jehovah, God Almighty, Jehovah is coming to fight. That's verse 3. Verse 3, right? Then shall Jehovah go forth, not the archangel Michael, and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet, Jehovah's, Jehovah's feet, Jehovah Witness, Jehovah's feet, anti-Trinitarian, Jehovah's feet, Unitarian, his feet, Jehovah's glorious, beautiful, blessed feet, shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Whoa! A day is coming where Jehovah's feet will land on the Mount of Olives, and from the impact of his feet, split the mount in half. Then the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, toward the west and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And then in case you didn't get it, it's Jehovah's feet, his beautiful, glorious, blessed feet, physically landing on the Mount of Olives, physically splitting it in half. In case you don't get that, it's Jehovah. Notice verse 5. Notice verse 5. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as he fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And Jehovah, my God, shall come and all the saints with thee. <whistles> Jehovah God will come on a day to destroy the armies of the nations that try to destroy that remnant of Israel that Jehovah preserves for his glory. And he's going to land on Mount Olives. And his feet will touch Mount Olives and split them out in half. And he's going to land with the holy ones. He's going to land with his holy ones. Wow. And we know Jehovah's feet here refer to literal physical feet and not simply a metaphor, an allegory. How do we know it's literal? Because the Mount of Olives will be literally split in half. The Mount will be physically split in half. You don't split the Mount physically, literally in half, by metaphorical feet. Right? Okay, now, can I ask you a question, Black Smurf, everyone else? Here's my question. Is the question. Jehovah will physically land on the Mount of Olives. 
with his physical feet. And from the impact, it will be split in half. But wait, Acts 1, 9 to 12 says, Jesus is the one who physically left the Mount of Olives in a physical body, now glorified, spiritualized, a physical body of flesh, now spiritualized in the, in the sense that it's under the dominion of the spirit that's immortal, indestructible. And he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives in that physical glorified body that has physical glorified feet. So if I connect the New Testament with the Old Testament, and I connect Acts 1, 9 to 12 with Zechariah 14, who is that God, that Jehovah, that Zechariah saw descending, whose feet he saw splitting the Mount of Olives in half? According to the New Testament, who is that Jehovah? Wow, Black Smurf. But now Black Smurf, pay attention also. It says Jehovah will come to the Mount of Olives with his saints, holy ones. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. When Jesus comes, who does he come with? First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. End of story. Done deal. The New Testament says Zechariah's God that he saw coming with the saints to the Mount of Olives, the feet of whose God split in half, is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. End of story. Done deal. Come. Comprehendo? Send this dog on his way. He's barking. Come on, Edmonds. You see a guy who wants to be flamed, you know, flamed and burned by a flame torch. All right. Did you get it now, Black Smurf? Were you listening from the beginning, Russo? The saints would refer to the angels. And the saints would refer to the believers who will come down with Jesus Christ to be reunited to their bodies that he will resect, resurrect, as Holy Spirit loosens my tongue, for the glory of Jesus Christ. But why focus on who the saints are? You're more concerned about who the saints are because you want to be part of that company when I'm more focused on how this proves that Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty. My focus is more on how this glorifies Jesus and proves he's the God of the Old Testament. He's Jehovah God Almighty. Whereas some of you are more interested in knowing, are you part of that company of saints? Why you selfish, little, wicked sinners? Repent. Right? Thank you, Anna. I don't care who the saints are. Meaning, whether it's referring to believers or angels or both, I'm more focused on how this now proves beyond any reasonable doubt that my Jesus is Jehovah God, the God of Zechariah, that Zechariah was worshiping my Jesus as his God. Because it's all about him. You little wicked sinner, repent. And Russo, give me your address because I want to come and lay hands on you so I can bless you. Come on, Russo. Hey, fuck up. Yeah, fuck up. Yeah. Right? Now, Black Smurf. I don't know how we got into. Yes, I know how. You're, you're asking, will Jesus return to the place that he left? Now, Black Smurf, do you see all the meat there? 
Jesus leaves the Mount of Olives physically, will return to the Mount of Olives physically. He left in a cloud. He'll reappear in a cloud. But his coming to the Mount of Olives and landing physically upon the Mount of Olives, where his physical feet, his glorified, beautiful physical feet, touch the Mount of Olives, fulfills Zechariah 14. And in Zechariah 14, there Zechariah says, it's the physical feet of Jehovah my God that touches the Mount of Olives. Thereby identifying Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty, the God that Zechariah saw coming to the Mount of Olives, the God that Zechariah, Zechariah worshipped as his God. Right? Not only so much lovely proof for Muslims and Jews, so much lovely proof for the Jehovah's Witnesses. Right? Clear? Now you see how far far afield we went from the topic of the Magi? I don't know if Andrew Martin is here, if he's still here. You see how far afield we went from the topic of the Magi? You see why you get I get nothing done? Thank you, Jonathan Simon. It was all about the Magi first and last. See, I was talking about how did the Magi know that Jesus is the God-man, and being God, he was worthy of their worship. So they were worshiping him as God. Because you remember in the first session, first and last, I said the Magi are the spiritual descendants, not the physical descendants, of the Magi at the time of Daniel. Because in the Greek version of Daniel, we are told that the astrologers are called Magoi, Magoi, and they would have known because of Daniel teaching them about the true God that the king of Israel is the God-man, that son of man who comes to rule over all nations, whom all nations must worship as the God-man. Right? Okay, so let me repeat and reiterate the point I'm trying to make. Why does Matthew mention Magi? And why do Magi worship Jesus, the child, and were they worshiping him as God or were they simply honoring him as a king? Well, let me answer the last question first. They were clearly worshiping the child as God because they knew that the king of Israel, though born as a babe, though a human child, was more than just a human being. He was God who became a human being. And how do they know that? Because of the name given to them by Matthew. Are you following with me? The name given to them by Matthew is Magi, Magoi, Majoi, however you want to pronounce the Greek. And that connects them with the astrologers of the book of Daniel, right? In Daniel chapter 1, <clears throat> Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 5, there was a group of astrologers that in the Greek version of Daniel and the details I gave you in the first part of the session. Okay, in the first part of the session, I gave you the lexical proof and the proof from the Greek version of the Old Testament. Those astrologers were called Magoi, Magi. And because of Daniel, they would have known, because of Daniel's revelation, that the king of Israel to come is the God man, God appearing as a man, God in human form, and that God man would be worthy of worship because that God-man is the king of all nations, not just Israel. And that's why I brought up Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Right? Now let's go back to Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Yep. Let's go back to Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Let's tie it in again. Why are you speaking German here, buddy? I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. Notice that all people, all nations, even the Magi, even the people from the east of Jerusalem, which would be the Iran and Iraq, Babylon and Persia, 
All nations includes the people east of Jerusalem, right? All of them would have to submit themselves to the Son of Man because he's their eternal king who rules over them forever and ever. Not only that, notice what the prophecy says. Notice what the prophecy says. And built for speed is already going too far afield, bringing up Numbers 24, 17, not being patient, which I don't know that means that does he want to be blocked? Hmm, let me think about it. Notice what he does. Instead of focusing on Daniel 7, he goes to Numbers 24, 17. Okay. Let's focus, okay, because he's trying to impress us. Built for speed. Come on, Sam, really? Are you trying to impress me that you know Numbers 24, 17? Focus, brethren, focus. Okay. Notice Daniel prophesied a son of man is coming on the clouds. His kingdom is eternal and destructible. He is the eternal king who rules over all nations forever. All nations, all peoples, all languages, including the Magi, the people of the east of Jerusalem. Now notice what 14 says about this son of man. Not only will he rule over all nations, but all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. Now let's unpack. Let's unpack the meat of this passage to prove that the Magi would have known of this prophecy, a prophecy that says that the Son of Man, who is the King of Israel, would come, and he's the King of all nations, and all nations must worship him as the God-Man. Right? You with me there? Let's unpack it now. How do we know that this Son of Man is God in human form? How do we know that this Son of Man is the God-Man, God appearing as a man? How do we know? Well, let's unpack it. The first line of evidence showing that the Son of Man is not just a human being, but God in human appearance. God in human appearance is that he rides the clouds of heaven. That's the first line of evidence. According to the Old Testament, as well as the ancient Near Eastern context, the ancient Near Eastern context, meaning the context in which Daniel is written, the ancient Near Eastern peoples associated the clouds with gods, goddesses, divine beings, to an ancient Near Eastern mindset, only a divine being rides the clouds. Are you with me there? Are you with me there? Both according to the Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern civilizations, riding the clouds was a divine function, a function carried out by a divine being, right? In fact, the false god Baal, 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 was known as the rider of the clouds, right? Did you know this? Baal, Baal, was known as the cloud rider, the rider of the clouds. And Baal was a divine being, the son of Il. So both in the Old Testament and to the ancient Near Eastern people, civilizations, riding the clouds was a function of the gods, gods and goddesses, the function of a god. A divine being and only a divine being would ride the clouds of heaven. In light of the Old Testament, God and God alone rides the clouds. Jehovah, Jehovah alone rides the clouds. You with me there? What did you think Baal was, Holy Tornado? Why do you think the nations worship Baal? Because he was a rat or a mouse or a fish? So, Holy Tornado, why did the people worship Baal? What did they think he was? They considered Baal a god, one of the gods, and the son of El or Il. Okay, now that's really confusing. Why would you think Baal is... Why would you think Baal 
was human. Man. Oh, and I was going to go back to a point I was making. Black Smurf, you know what my frustration is? And this, again, because Holy Tornado brought it up. You know what my frustration is and why I get discouraged and I feel sad? One of the reasons is because Christians today have so much resources available, free, because of the Internet, God's gracious provision of allowing us to discover the Internet, right, <clears throat> to come up with this technology and the Internet, where now we have all these Bible resources online for free, free a fingertip away, so that the, the wealth of information, on the Bible, its origin, its historical, cultural, ancient Near Eastern background, which helps us to better understand the context of the Bible, right? And yet, the level of biblical illiteracy is scary and alarming, right? And it frustrates me because I wonder what our church is doing. Here we have people who have been walking with the Lord for years, and this information becomes shocking to them, and they're blown away, and yet many of them go to churches and have been going to churches for years. What does this say about the state of the church in, in the West and in America? And it frustrates me, right? And it saddens me, it hurts me, and angers me. For example, someone like Holy Tornado all these years thinking that Baal was a human being that died. I'm not upset at Holy Tornado, and I'm not upset at Black Smurf. I'm upset at the churches that they've been going to or, or been reared in. What are these pastors doing? Why? What are they getting paid to do? Why are they getting paid? Why are they getting paid when they're not doing their job? It's killing me. No, you don't need to. Why would you need to be sorry, Holy Tornado? It's just an indication of the kind of information Christians are being fed in the churches today. It's becoming sickening. It's becoming sickening. Yes, they need the guidance of Muhammad, the dog of Satan. Satan's son. You're right. His guidance to send you to hell. Right? So this is my frustration. But now in Daniel 7, is it clear that the Son of Man rides the clouds of heaven? That's clear in the text, right? The text is clear. He's a cloud rider. He rides the clouds of heaven. And to repeat the point, in light of the ancient Near Eastern context, Ancient Near Eastern peoples, ancient Near Eastern civilizations associated riding the clouds with gods, goddesses. They saw that as a function of the gods, the goddesses. In particular, especially in Ugarit, where they worshipped El and the sons of El, one of whom was Baal. Baal or Baal or Baal, everyone pronounce the name was known as the writer of the clouds. And Baal wasn't viewed as a human being, but a divine being, one of the sons of El, one of the sons of Il. Now, I'm pronouncing it El and Il not to confuse you, because if I say El, you're going to think the letter L. Now, I'm talking about the word El, E-L. You know, if I were to transliterate the Hebrew, it's E-L. El or Il is a name that even the Old Testament uses for the true God, Jehovah, such as Israel, Emmanuel, Ishmael, right? Now, this word El or Il, which the Old Testament uses for God, the true God, and is one of the names of the Messiah, one of the names of the Messiah is Il. Did you know that? You guys know that, right? The Old Testament prophesied that Messiah, Mashiach, who is Jesus, right, is Il, El, E-L. You know where? Where does the Old Testament prophesy that the Messiah to come, Mashiach, Christos, 
when we know to be Jesus, he is El, or you want to pronounce it El, not to confuse you. Not in Jeremiah, no. Not in Jeremiah. Where? Two of you got it. Two of you said it. Three of you said it. Riaz, where does Micah 5.2 call him L? You're killing me, brother. I'm about to throw myself out the first floor window. Thankfully, I'm in the first floor. You mentioned it. Isaiah 9.6. Isaiah 9.6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. You know what the name Mighty God is in Hebrew? El Gibor. El or Il, God, Gibor, the Mighty. So this child who is born, who will sit on the throne of David forever, according to Isaiah 9, 7, he is called Il Gibor, God the Mighty. Not only that, Isaiah 7, 14. For, for the virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, a child, a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Emmanuel, right? Emmanuel, with us, Il. With us is God. I've already extended a debate. I challenged him. To debate me and Michael Brown, but he won't debate because he knows Brown will decimate him and I will bury him further in hell with his dead rabbis, those blasphemous sons of Satan, as he is one of them. Right? So now, guys, do you see that in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, this word El or Il is used for the true God, right? Is used for the true God. You guys got that part? You got that, right? Folks, when you see the children of the devil, these demons coming, manifesting in the comment section, block them, please. Okay? So you guys got it, right? All right. But with that said, even the pagans, the pagans, the ancient Near Eastern peoples, the pagan nations surrounding the Israelites, they too use this word, El or Il. But they used it for their false god. The Canaanites called their chief god Il. They used this for the chief god Il, and he was called the father of years. And he had 70 sons, the sons of Il. And he had also a son named Baal, Baal. Did you know that? The Canaanites worshipped Il as the chief god, the father of years, and the gods were called his sons, the sons of Il, and one of his sons was Baal, Baal. Send Dave T on his merry way. He's not here listening. He's here to distract. Not Ilah, no. Il, not Ilah. So Baal was the son of Il, the pagan pantheon of the Canaanites. And Baal was called the writer of the clouds. Yeah, Russo Ed, you can do so by sending it here. Sam underscore. S-H-M-N at hotmail.com. God bless you, brother. Lord willing, I'm going to have to change my account in the near future. Pray for my success. So did everyone get this? Are you learning now a little more about the ancient cultural context of the Old Testament? So it was the battle of the gods. What the Israelites were saying to the Canaanites our eel is the true eel, not yours. Your eel is a false eel. He's a false god. 
Jehovah is the true eel. He is eel and only him. You understand? It was a battle of the eels. Whose eel, whose L was the true L? Israel is saying it's Jehovah. Okay, now let me shock you a little more. Let me shock you a little more. I just said the Canaanites called Baal or viewed Baal as the rider of the clouds. I don't know whose number this is. Hold on. Okay. Rider of the clouds, right? And Baal was the son of Il, right? Follow with me, Il. With me so far? Everyone with me so far? Il was also called the father of years. The father of years. Okay? The father of years. And the gods were called the sons of Il. El. The sons of El. Okay. Let me tell you what Daniel just did in Daniel 7. Okay, now let me really blow you away. Let's go to Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. Now you're going to appreciate what Daniel's doing because he's writing at a time in the 6th century BC where the Babylonians also believe this, right? They also had the same conception of gods and goddesses, right? Their pantheon was similar, if not identical to the pagan pantheon of the Canaanites. Okay, now read with me. Read with me. I beheld till the thrones, notice thrones, plural, not singular. Thrones, plural, not singular. So there's more than one. So Daniel sees a vision. He sees thrones, more than one, were cast down. The Ancient of Days did sit. So now you have a figure called the Ancient of Days. A being of many years. Very ancient. His days are quite old. Right? Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. So he sees a being appearing visibly, and in that visible form, he sees this being having white hair and a white robe. Okay, pay attention. Whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne, singular. Guys, you have to pay attention. So Daniel saw thrones, more than one, but now he sees the Ancient of Days on one throne. His throne, singular was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Now let's read verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Okay, let's unpack this. Guys, pay attention. Don't go off topic. Focus. Daniel has a vision. He sees more than one throne. But then he sees... An occupant of one of the thrones. This occupant, he calls the Ancient of Days. He appears in visible form. He's got a white robe that Daniel sees and white hair that Daniel sees. And that one sits on one throne. That means there's another throne for another occupant, right? Another throne for another occupant. You with me so far? You're getting it? Everyone getting it, right? Okay. I don't know if you're seeing the connection. I just said that the Canaanites worshipped the high god El or Il. He was called the father of years. The gods were called the sons of Il. And Baal, Baal, was the rider of the clouds. And he was considered the son of Il. Okay. Here you're seeing Daniel... Pretty much attacking the Babylonian pantheon of gods and goddesses as false and showing them the true pantheon of God. Notice Il is called the father of years. But here God is called the ancient of days. Do you see what's happening here, folks? 
He's attacking the Babylonian pantheon of gods and goddesses as false and showing them who the true father of years happens to be. It's not your eel. It's my God, Jehovah. Are you catching what he's doing? I got to take it real slow. Hope you're appreciating that I'm going slow because, to be honest, it's tiring me out. I'm getting tired, really, because I feel like I'm just burning you with this. But if it's blessing you and it's exciting you and causing you to love our God even more and love Jesus even more and appreciate the Bible even more and it's building your confidence to know that the Bible is truly the Word of God, then it's worth it because our God is worth it. Okay. Okay, now, Ancient of Days is Jehovah. In contrast to your God, Il, whom you call the Father years, he's a false God. But don't forget, Daniel sees thrones, more than one, and the Ancient of Days occupies only one throne. Who occupies the other throne? Because he saw thrones, more than one. But the Ancient of Days only takes one throne. So there's another throne left for someone else. That's where Daniel 7, 13 and 14 comes in. Daniel 7, 13 and 14 comes in. Now let's read Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him. So the Son of Man brought before the Ancient of Days. Count, folks. Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days. He comes to the Ancient of Days and he's brought before him. Now you have two, Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. Hmm. But then this Son of Man is given a dominion, a kingdom. Oh, wait. For someone to have a kingdom, he has to have a throne. Oh, now we see why Daniel sees two thrones. Two thrones. One for the Ancient of Days and the other for the Son of Man. Wow. Wow. <whistles> but hold on. If the Son of Man is Jesus, according to the New Testament, and the New Testament says he approached the Father in heaven to receive his kingdom, then who is the Ancient of Days? Who's the Ancient of Days? Come on, Remy. Remy, you're going to make me give up on ministry. The Father! Roger, are you serious? And Melchizedek, do I need to bounce you for that? I just gave you the answer. If Jesus is the Son of Man, according to the New Testament, if Jesus is the Son of Man, according to the New Testament. And the New Testament says Jesus approached the Father in heaven to receive the kingdom. Then who's the Ancient of Days that the Son of Man approaches? Brah, tell me about it. Black Smurf, you here too? Folks, don't complicate things. Honestly, you don't need to be Einstein, and you don't need to be a PhD to understand. I promise you don't. And, folks, I don't say this to condescend. I mean, I'm being honest. You guys are intelligent. You are. Because, number one, God has given you wisdom, and, number two, the Holy Spirit is in you. Don't make things complicated and think you have to come up with some fancy answer. Sometimes it's the simple answer that's actually the correct response. I said it. Listen. I'm teaching you to listen and, and understand. If the Son of Man is Jesus according to the New Testament, I gave you the answer. And Jesus approaches the Father in heaven to receive the throne. So if Jesus is the Son of Man of Daniel 7, and he approaches the Father to receive the throne, then the Ancient of Days that the Son of Man approaches in Daniel has to be the father right 
right? I gave you the answer when I said, Jesus approaches the Father in the New Testament to receive the kingdom. Well, I, I gave you the answer. You don't need to guess. Who's the ancient days? Well, it's got to be the Father. If the Son of Man approaches the ancient of days, New Testament says that Son of Man is Jesus, and he approaches the Father. Guess what, folks? The ancient of days has to be the Father. Right? Everyone got it? Are you sure you're getting that the Ancient of Days is the Father? Because I don't want to now ask you a question and you don't answer correctly because I'm going to throw myself on the floor and start crying and start wailing like a spoiled brat. You sure you get the fact that the Ancient of Days is the Father? You sure? You get it? I don't know if you understand the implication of it. Let's read Daniel 7, 9 again. Let's read Daniel 7, 9. See if you get it now. Let's see if you really got it. Daniel 7, 9. Daniel 7, 9. I beheld till the, thr the, till the thrones were cast down, and ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and as the hair of his head was like pure wool. You know what you just told me, Andrew, everyone else? The Father appeared in visible form, and Daniel saw the Father visibly. Daniel saw the Ancient of Days, who is the Father, with white hair and a white robe. So he saw the Father appearing as an elderly man. That's what you just told me. So Daniel saw Father and Son both appearing in visible form form as humans did you get it ancient of days white hair white robe son of man one looks like the son of man two divine figures persons both appearing in human form. We were sailing along on a moonlight bay. I didn't say same form, so you're confusing me. Human form doesn't mean they have the same form. That means they both appeared as humans. So don't confuse me, Alma. I didn't say they appeared in the same form. It's not what I said. Both of them take on human form. Not the same form, but their forms are human. One of whom appears as an elderly human being, an older human being. So I don't know why you're mishearing me. Don't. Interpret my words contrary to what I said. Please don't do that. Don't misrepresent me. Please. You with me there? Now, can I ask you a question? Why does the father appear as an older person? Why does he appear as an older person? Because white hair means a person that's very old. A person that's very old. Yes. Because to fit the title Ancient of Days. If he's called the Ancient of Days, then he's going to look like someone who's very ancient. Yes, Remy, you got it. He's going to appear in a way that fits his description as the Ancient of Days. If he's the Ancient of Days, that means he's quite old. He's a very old figure. He's been around for a long time. So then how do you appear as an older person? Because when you see an older person, you know this person's been around for a long time. Yeah. And why does he appear as the Ancient of Days, someone who's quite old? Because with age comes wisdom. The older you are, the more experience you have, the wiser you are. So God is appearing as an older person, white hair, white robe, to show that I'm a very 
ancient figure. I'm a very old person. And because I'm very old, very ancient, I have a lot of wisdom. So learn from me. Trust me. Take my advice. Andrew, go back and listen to the rest of it. I'm almost done with this session. God bless you. Merry Christmas. We'll see you, Lord willing, sooner than later. Okay, you catch it? Okay. But, folks, in light of the ancient Near Eastern cultural context, here you have God the Father appearing in a visible human form where he has white hair, white robe, white robe signifying purity, that he's completely pure. That's why it's white. Purity, absolute pure, righteous, holy. And he's on a throne. And the pagans, like the Canaanites, as well as the Babylonians, right? Because it's it's basically the same pantheon of gods, goddesses, with different names. But it's basically the same. They viewed Il as the father of years. And they viewed Il as the one that was the father of the gods. So the gods were called the sons of Il, right? And Baal, his son, as the rider of the clouds. So guess what Daniel did? God appeared to Daniel in a fashion that mimicked what the pagans believed in order to attack the pagan belief in Il as and Baal. In other words, this was a polemic. God's polemic, his attack against the pagan beliefs that Eel is the father of years and Baal, his son, is the writer of the clouds because what God is showing Daniel to show the Babylonians, no, your Eel is not the father of years and your Baal, your Baal, your Baal is not the writer of clouds. Let me tell you who the true Eel is. Here is the true ancient of days, Jehovah. And here is the true writer of the clouds, the son of man. And we know to be Jesus. So what you're finding in Daniel is an inspired, polemic, apologetic, attacking the gods and goddesses of the Babylonians. You understand what's happening here? This is God's way of attacking the belief of the Babylonians. And those who came before them showing your eel is not the father of years. And your Baal, Baal, is not the writer of the clouds. Your eel is a false god. Baal is a false god. Baal is another name of Satan. Here is the true eel, the true father of years, the true ancient of days. And here is the true cloud writer, the son of man. Is it sinking in now? Exactly crazy miles. Like God's attack on, on the Egyptian gods. It's a polemic. What God is saying is, how dare you take what is true of me, my description, and ap apply it to your false gods and goddesses. I am the father of yours. I am the ancient of days. Right, And the angelic hosts are my sons. And here's the true writer of the clouds, the son of man, who is the king of Israel, who is the Messiah, whom we know to be Jesus, the father's beloved son. Now, who do you think learned all this at the time of Daniel? Who was the recipient of this revelation? Who was privy to this revelation? Whom did Daniel preach this to? Whom did Daniel instruct and teach? All of these truths. The Magi. The Magi. That means the Magi of Daniel's day learned the eel of the Babylonians is a false god. Baal is a false god. He's not a true God, and he's not the writer of the clouds. The writer of the clouds is the son of man who will be born king of Israel, who's the king of all nations, whom all nations must worship as God. 
And yet he's distinct from the ancient of days because we know that this son of man will approach the ancient days showing that the ancient of days and the son of man are two divine persons, two divine figures who rule forever and worthy of all worship. Now, does the story of Matthew 2 make sense? Does the story of Matthew 2 make sense? Thank you, Jonathan Simon. That means the Magi came into a saving knowledge of the true God, repented of their idolatry, started worshiping the God of Daniel, and prepared those who came after them who continued in their craft for the coming king of Israel. And they would have been instructed that when he comes, he is the God man, God being born as a human babe, worthy of your worship, because he's the true God man, the true rider of the clouds, the king of all nations. When he is born, worship him. Making sense? Is it all making sense? So if someone asks you, who are the Magi? You have your answer. And if someone asks you, well, how do you know they're worshiping him as God? You have your answer. You get it? So what's the proof that the Son of Man is God? He rides the clouds, which to the pagans would have meant he's a divine being. You with me there? Even to the pagans, to the Babylonians, to the Persians, to ride the clouds would have conveyed to them this one who looks human, who appears in human form and human semblance. He is truly a divine being, right? But let's put that aside. Let's put that aside. Can we prove from the Old Testament that riding the clouds is something that only the true God does? Are you ready for the proof from the Old Testament? So we can wrap things up, and I got to do a part three, because I got to do a part three, okay? Nahum chapter one, verse three. Nahum chapter one, verse three. Nahum chapter one, verse three. The book of Nahum. The, the Lord Jehovah, pay attention. The Lord Jehovah, slow to anger and great in power. And will not at all acquit the wicked. Jehovah the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. Bam. Jehovah rides the clouds. Isaiah 19 verse 1. Isaiah 19 verse 1. Isaiah 19 verse 1. The burn of Egypt. Behold, Jehovah rideth upon a swift cloud. Hmm. Jehovah rideth upon a swift cloud. I don't know if Black Smurf is still here. What did Jesus ride on to get to heaven? Acts 1. A cloud. A swift cloud. Because when he entered the cloud, he was gone. Swiftly. Gone. Do you remember that in Acts 1.9? A cloud appeared, took off. Swiftly. Gone. So Jesus rides a swift cloud. Just like Jehovah does in Isaiah 19.1. Jehovah rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, at his face, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. Right? Okay. Psalm 104 verse 3. Psalm 104 verse 3. Psalm 104 verse 3. Who layeth the beams of the chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. <whistles> wow. Jehovah does this. Hmm. Numbers 10, verse 34. Numbers 10, verse 34. 
I mean, it's over and over and over and over again. All throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. Numbers 10, verse 34. And the cloud of Jehovah was upon them by day when they went out of the camp. Hmm. The cloud of Jehovah. Wow. Who rides the heavens? Deuteronomy 33, 26. Man, I can give you verse after verse after verse after verse, but I think this will suffice. Deuteronomy 33, 26. Who rides the clouds of heaven? Who rides the heavens? Who rides the heavens? The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. And then 27, verse, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, 26. Why'd you put 27? You threw me off. Deuteronomy 33, 26. Why'd you put 27, bro? There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky. He rides the heavens. I was clear. I said Deuteronomy 33, 26, right? Like he threw me off. I'm like, what happened? Hmm. Don't ever do that to me and try to discombobulate my computer system, you wicked sinner. You see Deuteronomy 33, 26? Who rides the heavens? Finally, Exodus 24, 9 to 11. Exodus 24, 9 to 11. Yeah, well, if he's got a box, I'll kick it. Exodus 24, 9 to 11. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. Notice, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. That's the cloud that God rides. A cloud that looks like sapphire stone. Pavement made out of sapphire stone. So when God rides the clouds, it looks like pavement made out of sapphire stone. Do you see it? As it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God and did eat and drink. Folks, according to the Hebrew Bible, it is Jehovah God that rides the cloud, rides on the clouds, that makes the clouds, the pavement for his feet, the dust of his feet, who rides the heavens. What in the world? Is the Son of Man doing riding the clouds of heaven? Why is he riding the clouds of heaven? The second line of evidence showing that the Son of Man is God. It says all nations must serve him. Daniel 7, 14. The Aramaic verb is pilach. Pilach. All nations must serve him, right? Daniel 7, 14, right? The Aramaic verb is pilach. Pilach. According to the book of Daniel, pilach, that Aramaic verb, is the worship given to God alone, a worship that you can't give to any other God. It's the worship you give to God alone. More specifically, it refers to priestly worship, sacred service connected with the rites of the temple. Let me show you where this word pilach is used for the worship of God. And it's a worship that you can only give to God. Daniel 7, 27. Daniel 7, 27. Serve him. Pilach in Aramaic, because this is written in Aramaic. This is the worship that Daniel says is to be given to God alone. Here's the proof. Same chapter. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom, the kingdom of the Most High, is an everlasting kingdom, just like the Son of Man's kingdom. And all dominion shall serve and obey him. Guess what the verb serve is? There. It's Pilach. But did you notice all the kings will serve the Most High? All the kings will serve the Most High. But earlier in that same chapter in verse 14, all the kingdoms and all the nations and all the peoples 
serve the Son of Man. Same Aramaic verb. Is it sinking in? Okay, now, let me show you how important this service is. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three friends of Daniel, were thrown into the fire because they refused to give this service to any other god but their own. They told the king, we will not serve, same Aramaic verb, same verb, Pilach, your god, we will serve only our God. Daniel 3, verse 12 and 14. Daniel 3, verse 12 and 14. Let's see what it, what it says. And we're almost done. Daniel 3, 12 and 14. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon... Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. Now notice, they serve, same Aramaic verb, not thy gods. They do not give your gods pilach, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now what does Nebuchadnezzar say to them in verse 14? Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods? You don't give pilach to my gods, is that true? You won't give pilach to my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now let, let's see what their response is. Daniel 3, 17 to 18. Daniel 3, verses 17 to 18. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able. Here's the same verb again. If it be so, our God whom we serve, same verb, we serve our God, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. He will deliver us from you. But now notice their faith. But if not, even if he doesn't deliver us and allows us to be burned, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve, same verb, pilach, thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We serve our God. We give pilach to him alone. And even if he's pleased to allow us to be burned by the fire, even then we won't give pilach to your gods because pilach is to be given to our God and our God alone. Now Daniel 3.28. Daniel 3.28. Daniel 3, 28. 3, 28, man. My goodness, you dropped the ball today. I'm getting tired of you. I don't want to ever see you again until next year. Daniel 3, 28. Man, this guy, you think you do a better job when he gets paid nothing. Daniel 3, 28. Read with me. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve Pilach nor worship any god except their own god. Did it make sense? Pilach, this Aramaic verb for service, is the kind of service you give to God alone. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego chose to be burned alive than to give Pilach to any other god except their god. But Daniel 7, 14 says, all nations, all languages, all kingdoms will give this Pilach to the Son of Man. They will worship the Son of Man with the same worship given to the god of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. So how do we know the Son of Man is more than human? We know he's human because he appears in human form, human semblance, human likeness, so he's human. But he's more than human. He's God in human appearance because he is worshipped as God and rides the clouds of heaven, something that only God does. 
He does it because he is God. But now notice, the Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days. He's different from the Ancient of Days. But like the Ancient of Days, he sits enthroned forever and ever. Like the Ancient of Days, he's worshipped as God. And like the Ancient of Days, he rides the clouds. That means Daniel was not a Unitarian. Daniel was a Trinitarian because God revealed to him the Trinity in all his glory. And he knew that the Son of Man is distinct from the Ancient of Days. And that Son of Man becomes the King of Israel. So that means he knew that Son of Man is God who becomes the human Messiah. Clear? Did it sink in? So I have to do a part three on Matthew chapter two in the Christmas story. But by the grace of the triune God, everything perfect is from him. Everything imperfect, sinful is from us. May God save us from our imperfection. Do you now understand the importance of the story of the Magi in Matthew chapter 2? If you do, I hope it now helps you better appreciate that story and prepares you spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically to worship the God-man whom the Magi worship come this Christmas. And we worship the God-man every day because Christmas is every day for us. Right? So go back, listen to these sessions, absorb the information, make the information second nature, share it with others, pass on the links to others, hit the like button, use the info to give God the glory he deserves, and may the Holy Spirit help us to fall more passionately in love with our God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, to become more like Jesus until we die or until he comes. And pray for me and my daughters. Folks, don't forget, as you celebrate Christmas, there'll be another Christmas I celebrate alone without my children. And I'm lonely without them. I love them. I'm in love with them. And I ache for them. Beg Jesus to bring me back into their lives. Beg Jesus to fight for me, to destroy this wicked judicial system, to remove this judge from my presence and shield me from her. Protect the money that God is bringing in for ministry for my children's sake, and to plant me here. Pray for a miracle January because I don't know what took place. But I'm trusting God. He will fight for me. Amen? To deliver me. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Come, Lord Jesus. And if I don't see you till after Christmas, Merry Christmas. He is the reason for the season. Worship the child who is the God child, the God babe, the God man that the Magi worship because they knew the King of Israel is the God man. They knew it because of their spiritual forefathers who were instructed by the true prophet of God, Daniel, who revealed all these mysteries to them. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Lord Jesus. Cover us by your blood and seal us. And my daughters, love them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Fight for them, Lord. And bring their Baba into their life. Please, Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Right? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Christ is risen. And he lives forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys.